Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Hi, Nika. Um, yeah, props. Did you get it going? I'm super nervous. I don't like, I actually don't like to speak in front of people. It makes me nervous. I like to speak to like my office. There's like 13 people. I can whip my house into shape. There's only four of us. But you guys, there's a lot of you here. <laughs> so I'm very nervous. So bear with me. Um, but something, you know, I'm sure you guys have never done this. But I prepared my talk and then I started researching it. Do you ever do this? Like do an assignment and then you start researching and then it gets closer and you're like, ah, I did it all wrong. Do you guys ever do that? Yes? No? Yeah? So something that I read this article and it said that, uh, that you need to know your audience. And I thought, I really don't know these guys because I'm 37. Some of you are 20. So if we put that in high school years, I would be 17 and you would be one. And I don't know, like I don't get, do you see what I mean? Like there's like a huge gap between like where I am and where you are, It's fine, I'll help. So what I wanna do is I wanna start with what are the burning questions you have about running a business or entrepreneurism this week? And I'm gonna write them down, we're gonna try to tackle them in the class, don't be shy. Think about what you would wanna ask someone. Anyone? No? Extra credit? No, it's not, just kidding, yes, go ahead. So starting idea, okay. Anything else? Yeah. So in the Etsy generation, how do you distinguish yourself and like set yourself apart from the rest of your competition? So distinguishing your brand, building a brand probably, building a brand. Okay. Okay, what else? Yes. So how to integrate vertically or how to get, okay, manufacturing. How to get started. Are we also talking China versus US in that or no? Okay. Okay. So we have starting, even getting an idea, building a brand, manufacturing. What other questions? Yes. So bootstrapping versus equity. Okay, I can only speak to bootstrapping, but we're raising money now, so I'll try to speak to that a little bit. Bootstrapping versus raising. Okay, one more question. Yes? And what other innovation experience do you have prior to this that helped you? I created a baby in my body. <laughs> so, I'm pretty innovative. Um, okay, one more question besides innovation. We can talk about innovation, but I think that's in with starting with an idea, right? Yeah, okay. Innovation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going through that right now. Um, big to little, little to big. Okay. Okay, so I have these slides. Um, they kind of make me sound smart, which I am a little bit, but I'm not super smart. Um, okay, so basically, um, how I started and grew my company without a college degree, it's just me being kind of funny because I, don't, I didn't go to college. Hi, Lorenzo. <laughs> he works for me. Um, okay, go ahead, Nika. Okay, so this is my son, Gus. Um, he was one of my first innovations. I grew him in my body. Um, <laughs> And so it's a really weird thing. How many of you guys have kids? So yeah, a lot, of, some of you, a little bit of you. Um, so kids actually come with their own, they come with their own personality, like, that's not new. But actually children come with their own unique style and it's very interesting. Um, stuff that I put my daughter in, I would never put my son in and that wasn't because boy, girl, because I dress my daughter pretty gender neutral. But when Gus was born, Gus just needed a pair of soft sold baby moccasins. That's what needed to exist for Gus, and I could not find it in the world. I didn't, it was nowhere to be found. I found Minnetonkas, um, they're a little soft sold, they don't stay on. I found um, these things called Robies. Have you ever seen Robies? Um, they have like bears and basketballs on them, and they're really colorful, and it, again, wasn't Gus's style. So um, when my daughter Hattie was born, who's nine, um, I had been meeting with a friend. And she was like, like, I was racking my brains. My husband was in school, we were so poor. I needed money, I didn't know what to do. Um, and she told me that she was going to start making stuff and sell it online. And 
I looked at that girl and I was like, you are not smarter than me, I'm gonna do the same thing. So, <laughs> I convinced my mom to buy me a sewing machine and I taught myself how to sew and I just started sewing and selling stuff online that pertained to my daughter. So I would sew like baby quilts and dresses and beach bags and all these fun things that I would do with my daughter. And I was terrifically terrible at running an Etsy shop at the time. I was really bad at it. So I taught myself how to run an Etsy shop. Um, part of running an Etsy shop, so I was probably like, I was like within the first 400 people that started an Etsy shop. And um, what, it was hard because like people were coming onto the platform so quickly, it was really hard to distinguish yourself. And so I had a friend who, um, who was a big blogger and she told me, I've never seen anyone run a successful Etsy shop without running a blog. And that was kind of enlightening to me. So I started a blog, and again, I was really bad at blogging as well. Um, so I was equally bad at blogging, and I was equally bad at running an Etsy shop. Um, but I was like learning, and I would put up a blog post, and it sucked. And I'd put up a product, and it sucked. But I just kept at it. I mean, I was making enough to go to Target and buy clothes for my daughter, and buy shoes, and do all these other things. So I felt like I was like rich, you know? Um, and then Gus came along, and I had been blogging and running an Etsy shop, so I would like make something, spend all night making something, take pictures of it, put it on my blog, and be like, look what I did, and then wait for people to tell me it was awesome, and then I put it in my Etsy shop. And that was kind of like the, plot, like the way that I did stuff. Um, and when uh, I made the moccasins for Gus, I just uh, taught myself how to sew leather, which is, I thought was the same, it was a little different. I didn't know you could sew it on a regular sewing machine. Um, and I had like swindled, negotiated um, this bag of scrap leather from this lady at a yard sale for a dollar. And so that's what I used. Um, and she, and it was like a big like black garbage bag, like a leaf bag. So I started with that and I made the moccasins and I put them on my website with no intention to sell them at all. And I, it blew up and by blew up I mean I got 14 comments instead of three. And people were like, I wanna buy these! And so I put them in my shop at a ridiculously low price. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. And I think to the point of like, how do you start? Like, where do you start with? I think like, look around you, what is a need? I've heard like, if you feel like this needs to exist, then you're the person who's supposed to bring it to market. If you have in your, like if you feel it within you, this has to come up. Um, so with the moccasins, I just, I was lucky I had Gus and I just started, oh, I don't like that, I don't like this. And I was able to like innovate really quickly just by like making a bunch of pairs for him. Um, but I would say, I, I don't even know, it was probably, who gets misquoted the most, Lincoln or Einstein? One of those guys. Um, they say, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And I think that's how you start. You start right exactly where you are. Okay. Oh, it's supposed to say generous compensation package. Um, so my first fire was my husband. And he was, when we fire someone at Freshly Picked, we don't, well we don't actually, I don't like to fire people. It's like the worst thing in the world. How many of you guys have ever had to fire someone? It sucks. And I've heard it never gets easier, is that right? Never gets easier. Um, so my first fire was my husband. And he taught me, and I'm still, a generous compensation package and I'm still actually paying for it like it's still going it's a still ongoing compensation package but um, he was doing graphic design for me very poorly um, he was packaging and shipping for me very poorly he was cutting um, leather for me very poorly and the thing was I was doing a lot of things very poorly so I needed someone else who could do things well not someone who could do them poorly so he was my first fire um, <laughs> and Actually, like, um, if you can work with your spouse, that is awesome. I can't work with my spouse. Um, I need to leave. We keep it separate. At this point in our life today, we've been married 12 years, we cannot build an Ikea dresser together. So it's not a good situation. But we collaborate really well on the children. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, no, almost two years now, my husband became a stay-at-home dad. and. Um, I started working, well I had already been working full time, we had a nanny, and um, I started making enough to cover both of our uh, salaries, um, 
because that's when I started paying myself. And so he, did, he, he stayed home. And I know um, it was not his first choice. And I know that it has taken a lot of personal sacrifice from him. Um, but we knew that that was the right thing for our family. And so he now stays at home. But because of that, he's become a professional drone pilot. Um, and I say he's been training for, it for his whole life. So if you're good at video games, they could come in handy someday. <laughs> um, Oh wait, what was I gonna? Oh, bootstrapping, let's go back to that one. Okay, oh no, I talk about that later. Okay, go ahead. Scrapping? Yeah, oh, this one, okay. bootstrapping. Okay, so this was my first little, is that feedback on me? This was my first little sewing room. Um, we had a two bedroom apartment. Um, we had my husband and me and our daughter in one room. It's a bad picture. Um, and then that's in my first warehouse. Um, so we, uh, when I started, and if, have you guys, is that me? Sorry. Um, so when I started, I had that big bag of scrap leather and I would just like make pairs and I'd put them up and whatever leather they were in, that's what you had to buy. And um, they started selling really quickly and I was like, okay, I gotta go, I'm gonna go to the leather store and I'm buy leather. And I had been buying fabric. So how it had been working before is I would like um, buy fabric, and I'd make something and I'd sell it, then I'd take all the profits from that and go and buy more fabric. And um, I went to the leather store and I was like, okay, I want a yard of this leather and I want half a yard of that leather and like three yards of that. And she's like, no, you have to buy the whole cow. And I was like, what? And she shakes out the leather and sure enough, it's a cow. And I was like, oh, how much is a cow? <laughs> and she's like, is this, this hide, this one hide in particular was $200 and I did not have $200 to my name. So I was like, what am I going to do? I got to buy a cow if I want to keep growing this business, but I don't have the money to buy a cow. So uh, my brother owns a window installation business and um, he pulls out aluminum framed windows and then replaces them with new frame, with new windows. And usually he'll just like um, take the windows home, bang out the glass, and then take all the, the aluminum to the scrapyard and then get money and like buy his guys lunch and stuff. So I convinced him to give me all his old windows for a summer. And I spent every day in the summer during nap time out in our yard, banging that freaking glass out of those windows. And um, at the end of the summer, I took all the frames to the scrapyard and I made $200 and I was able to buy my first height of leather with that. Um, and that's how I started bootstrapping. That was, that was my first investment in the business total. Like before then it was just like $15 here, $20 here, but that was it. Um, and then we sold all the moccasins from that hide, makes about 40 pairs and we were able to invest all of that back into the business, sold all the mocks, invested it back, sold all the mocks, invested it back. To this day, we've never raised money. It's all been from that first $200. Um, now, currently, we're in like um, a really high growth stage of our business um, because we've taken on um, wholesale. We've, all, we've been direct, direct to consumer until um, last year. And so we need, we're trying to raise some money. We also want to bring in some key employees and bring some new product to the market. Everything is really expensive now. Running our office is more expensive. So we are, for the first time ever, taking private equity money. Um, but I'm also in a really unique position because I have a profitable company that I own 100% of. And so I, can, I have so many options when it comes to raising money. And in fact, like every PE company I talk to, they get like this little twinkle in their eye when I say that. And it's just in a re I'm in a really good position. Um, I think I've, I don't know if there's a way to do that with like, um, with software, I don't think there is. Um, even consumer brands now, you have to kind of move quickly to market. So I feel like because I started in 2009, right after the market had crashed and I was able to really take it slow, I think that's why it worked for me. So um, who had the bootstrapping versus raising question? Did that answer your question? No, do you need more? Do you wanna talk about raising money? It sucks. Here's, here's kind of the theory on raising money. <laughs> First of all, it's like dating. So if you're bad at dating, you're probably bad at raising money. I sucked at dating. Um, <laughs> it's so much is like, um, well, 
How many of you guys are familiar with chat books? Has Nate come and spoken? Nate Quigley? Nate Quigley says um, there is a, oh, what's his name? He's a rapper. He's from Florida. He performed with J-Lo. No, not him. Nika. Come on. Oh my gosh. Anyway, his song is Ask for Money, Get Advice. Ask for Advice, Get Money Twice. Thank you, Pitbull. So that's what you got to do. When you're raising money, remember Pitbull says, Ask for Money, Get Advice, Ask for Advice, Get Money Twice. So when you're raising money, you're not in the money business, you're in the advice business. And everyone you talk to, you say, Hey, I need some advice. And most people, people love to give advice because they love to hear themselves talk. And so I think it probably worked for dating. Can someone try it and tell me? Nika, Come on. thank you. <laughs> ask for a date, get advice, ask for advice, get dates twice. Let's see if it works. Okay. Oh, paying off the creditors. You guys, we had the prettiest font. It didn't transfer. It's Nika's fault. <laughs> um, okay, so this is Angie right here. And that's Jody. And Angie was my first employee. She just stopped working for me six months ago. Um, and she sewed my moccasins. Um, she kept working. She was still sewing six months ago, and then she decided to move on and do other stuff. Um, but I said, as long as Angie wants to have a job here, she'll have a job here, and then she decided to move on. So she decided not to have a job here anymore. Anyway, um, so Angie and I were working. Jody was doing shipping for us. Um, and Angie came to me, and it was right before Christmas, and she was like, um, so I'm going to lose my house and I don't know what to do, and I'm really scared. Um, and I was like, okay, how much do you owe? And she told me, and then uh, my husband had been in school and somehow we'd missed a student loan payment, and all of a sudden, or a student loan portion, and it all came due at once. So between me and Angie, we needed to make 10 grand in a month, and I was so scared because we'd never done it before. And um, so I was like, okay, let's figure this out. Like, how can we make 10 grand? So it was right around Christmas, so we decided we were gonna have like this big sell. Um, and uh, she, we wrote down this goal, and it was, we had to sell 200 pairs of moccasins, which was scary, because we hadn't done that. But, I mean, to give you some context, like now we sell that in like a day. So it was like way, it was, it was a while ago. Um, and so we wrote down the goal. We had to sell 200 pairs of moccasins. I got to work on social media. I worked my butt off. Angie got to work sewing. She worked her butt off. And we did, we did 15 grand. And from that, we were able to pay her house off, um, pay off my student loan, and then we still had money to keep going. So it was really exciting. But um, it seems like a small thing. But at the time, like my husband was still working. I was working out of my basement. I was losing my mind. And I think what I learned, like the biggest thing that I learned from that was that like building a business is not like, oh my gosh, what, what I thought it was like, hey, I'm going to show up to the office and my hair is going to look amazing every day. I'm going to have an endless supply of really cool leather jackets and everyone's going to respect me and like love me. And it's not how it is. My hair only looks good two days a week on the wash days. Um, I have a pretty good leather jacket collection, but it's not as awesome. And at the end of the day, like, you care about your business and you want it to succeed and you hope you hire people and you incentivize them enough to care about your business and, you, and they want to, that, that they will want to, it to succeed as much. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And so for me, it's not about like these big moments or even like arriving. I hate when people, how do you know when you made it? Well, I haven't made it yet, so I'll let you know I don't know when, but it's about like setting small incremental goals um, or big goals, even stretch goals, which I'll get into later, and like slowly working your butt off to achieve those goals. And then once you achieve that goal, set another goal. And once you achieve that goal, set another goal. It's, you're not going to like all of a sudden build a business. It's small little things that get you there. What is that? The day I almost quit. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk to you about building a brand a little bit. So when I started, uh, blogging was kind of like the only way to get the word out um, and to market yourself. And then Facebook started. Facebook 
has always been and will continue to be confusing because of the algorithm. And um, I, we didn't pay to play at the time. Um, and Instagram seemed to be kind of like this jam and I started watching Instagram a lot and then I realized new moms love Instagram. And you think about it like you're having a baby so you start taking pictures of your bump, you start taking pictures of the nursery so you can share with family members and then you have the baby and you're up late at night feeding your baby and what are you doing with your other hand, your one finger scrolling through Instagram. At the time Instagram was the only platform that lended itself to a one finger scroll. I think Facebook has gotten a little better, but still how many times do you like accidentally hit something on Facebook? You rarely do that on Instagram. So I started really focusing on Instagram. So when I started on Instagram, I had about 600 followers. And I was like, okay, that was in January. By December, I'm gonna get to 10,000 followers. And I worked my butt off. And so what did I do? I started like, okay, I need my, everything to look consistent. I need people to be able to look at a picture and say, okay, that's freshly picked. So I started playing with filters and I started really putting a lot of time into learning photo editing apps. Um, and I started noticing, oh, if you interact with your community a lot, they, they interact with you. So I started, every time someone would comment, I'd comment back to them, but then I'd go a step further and I'd go to their page and I'd like three or four of their pictures and then I'd comment, leave a comment there. And if they seemed relevant or if I seemed like they were exciting, then I'd follow them. Um, or the next time they commented, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I just saw Johnny's little birthday party. It looked darling. Thanks for your comment. So I really started to build a community. In fact, I spent so much time on Instagram that year. My husband said to me, I wish you loved me as much as you loved Instagram. And I said, me too. We would be really killing it right now. Um, so by December 28th, we hit 10,000 followers. And it was awesome. Let's celebrate. Um, and we were going into the new year just killing it. Sales were up. I could put something on, on Instagram. People would buy it. And um, in May, I was like, it was me, Jody, and Angie still, just us three. And I was like, let's have a sell. We haven't done a sell for a long time. Let's have a sell. Let's put the whole shop on $45, like 25% off. Um, and we're like, OK, let's do this. Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit though. We had just started manufacturing. So we hadn't gotten our first shipment yet, but we were working with a manufacturer and they were helping us to um, develop all of our dyes and like our patterns. And we were expecting our first shipment any day. So at that time, Angie could make about 250, 300 pairs of moccasins a week. And we were expecting our first big shipment from our manufacturer of 300 moccasins. So we were like, yeah, let's do this. Um, and you know what, let's just oversell, it's fine, it's not a big deal. We'll be able to make whatever we sell. So we put the shop on sale, and within like three hours we'd sold 3,000 pairs of moccasins. And I was like, holy beep, what are we gonna do? <laughs> and um, so we just kept seeing the sales come through, come through, come through, it was awesome. And then pretty soon there was like nothing left because we just like, were like, no, let's not, let's not put more we can't oversell anymore, this is it. So I went home and I cried and I cried and I cried because we, it was gonna take us 10 weeks to get this product out, optimistically. That was if we could sew and cut everything that every person had ordered and it would kind of be a crap show. So I called my friend Noelle, who uh, sits on my board today, um, and I was like, okay, so well, I got an idea. I told her the whole thing and I was like sobbing and I was like, I have an idea. I'm just going to return everyone's money. We're going to get our together and then we're going to, oh. <laughs> is there a swear jar? <laughs> Sorry. I, it's, the, it's the only reason I'm not translated is because I keep swearing. So, um, so I was like, we're going to get our crap together. And then we'll just do this again in three months and it'll be fine. And she was like, boo-hoo, Susan. Stop your crying. It's so hard. Oh my gosh, you're so successful. Shut up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she's like, you know what you're going to do is you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to put your big girl panties on and you're going to figure this out. And I don't want to hear you cry about it one more time. You have what is referred to as a good problem 
and you're gonna solve it. So that's what I did. We got up the next morning and Jody and I and Angie, we got together and we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? So we decided the first thing was like, we have to be 100% transparent with our customers. If we try to like gloss this over and pretend what happened didn't happen, people are gonna know and they're not gonna respect us. So, and it was our brand to be super transparent. That's always been part of our brand is like, let's be super transparent, let's let people know what's going on. So we put up an Instagram post about how, well, we didn't expect that, thank you for your support. Um, we are not gonna be able to get these moccasins out for a couple months. We, We'll, if you, have, if you want to cancel your order, email us, we're happy to cancel it. If you want to change it, let us know. And then additionally, we send an email to every single person that ordered um, and, told, and explain them, to them the situation as well, just in case they weren't following us. And we didn't get one cancellation. In fact, one girl that ordered during the sale, she's come back and purchased like an additional five times from us, and over the lifespan is, ha is like a $3,000 um, like customer. So it took us about 10 weeks to get everything out. Um, we got it out, I lived, and then we had $120,000 in the bank. So it ended up really awesome and we were able to do so many awesome things. And that was also, it led to my first million dollar year. So don't quit. Okay, wait, branding. Oh, let's go back a little. Um, okay, so there are a couple really important things you guys probably already know this because you can figure stuff out and you're really smart and you're in college. But um, branding consists of, I think these are the three things that I think are really important. Consistency, content, and just being super nice or know your voice. So our voice is, we deal with new mothers, we deal with expectant mothers. So we're super nice and we add a little bit of sass in at the end. Um, if you're dealing with people who watch Star Wars all the time, that needs to be your voice. If you're dealing with people who drink Mountain Dew all the time, that needs to be your voice. I would say the best social media that I've ever seen is Taco Bell. How many of you guys follow Taco Bell? Taco Bell knows their audience. It's 17-year-old boys who smoke a lot of pot and eat fourth meal. And they nail it every single time. It's fine, they, they, they do it. You can even order on your app and just drive up and get it. You don't even, it's not complicated. Um, we tried it, it was awesome. <laughs> so know your voice, build a brand. If you wanna build like a luxury brand, don't ever put your product on sale. If you wanna build a deal brand, put your product on sale. I'm gonna tell you though, a deal brand consumer is much more difficult to deal with than a luxury brand consumer or even a high-end brand consumer. We, we've built a luxury brand at Freshly Picked. $60 baby shoes, I understand, like I'm not dumb. They are inaccessible for a lot of people. And so every other touch that our brand has with people, we try to make it very accessible. So it's not like, oh, you come to our site and you're like, ooh, I don't identify with any of this. You come to our site and if you're a mom, you should feel right at home. Or if you're a parent, you should feel right at home. So be conscious of how your brand looks and understand where you want your brand to go. Okay. What? Five minutes? Crap. Um, the year I said yes to everything. Um, so, you, if you're an entrepreneur, the, unless your parents are super rich and unless you've been afforded a lot of luxuries in your life, you're gonna really have to network yourself into a lot of stuff. I took a year and I told my husband at the beginning of the year, I kind of picked themes for the year. Last year was the year I traveled. This year is the year, I don't know, we'll get there. Um, but two years ago, I said yes to everything. And what I did was I didn't turn down an invitation to a party, I didn't turn down an invitation to a dinner. I said yes to every time someone asked me out to lunch. I said yes to every conference I was asked to speak at. I said yes to everything. I was not home that year. I barely saw my family. But we were able to get on the Ellen Show from one of the relationships that I built that year. We were also able, I was also able to like hire some really good people. I built my board that year. Um, I had my first $5 million year that year. I was able to network myself onto Shark Tank, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so if you're looking to network, say yes to everything. Okay. Shark Tank. Okay, so the beginning of the year, um, what year was that? 2013. Yeah, I decided I was gonna be on Shark Tank. So I wrote it down on my list of things to do. And I went to this conference. I started watching all the Shark Tanks. And I went to this conference and I sat across um, from this girl at dinner, 
And I was like, oh my gosh, she looks so familiar. And so we started talking. She had been on Shark Tank and I was like, oh, I'm trying to get on Shark Tank. So she introduced me to her producer um, who then emailed me and that's how I got on the show. It was really that easy. And then people, we'd be at, a, like we were out in California and people were like, oh, I had to stand in the rain for 20 hours in LA. And I'm like, I know, it was just awful. Cause I felt bad, but um, because of Shark Tank, we were able to like pull so many levers in our marketing. So I wanted a deal on Shark Tank, but I was also, I think sometimes people go on Shark Tank and they don't understand this, a television show first, and they're casting you for a role first. And then second, it's a closed door investment, investor meeting. So if you understand that, then you do fantastic on the show. And if you don't understand that, then you tend to come away feeling bitter and angry. I feel that I, I understood that. They wanted me to be the simple Mormon mom from Provo, Utah, who wowed them with my numbers, and that's what I did. Um, but, uh, and then in the end, Damon and I didn't, we, we did a deal on the show and we didn't end up closing the deal. And, um, but, and that happened before the, the show aired. The show still aired, and I was able to pull all these marketing lovers at the time, and we grew our Instagram by 20,000 the night it aired, and we grew our Facebook by 20,000, and we grew our email list by 30,000. And then we had all these people in our sales funnel and were able to market and sell to them. Okay. Uh, know your numbers and be nice. Um, is, this, is this it? Is this, are we done? Two minutes. I, two minutes, okay. Okay, so I watched, in, in preparation for Shark Tank, I watched like every single episode there had been and um, really tried to, first of all, I wanted to understand the questions that they took so I, would, so I could understand it. Plus I wanted to get a feel for the characters that they were playing. And then I also was trying to look for like um, traps. Because how many of you guys have seen Shark Tank and you see that person, they come out and they, you're like, no, 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 go back. This is a mistake. <laughs> the thing is some producer told that person, this is a good idea, you should go out and do this. And so, I didn't want to fall victim to that. So I noticed that if you knew your numbers and you were nice to the sharks, then they treated you with the same respect. So I found every single question that they asked on the show and I created like these flashcards and I have them. If any of you are in Shark Tank, I'll be happy to send you the cards. Um, and I knew every question they were gonna ask me. I knew it inside and out. I understood why the numbers worked that way. I understood like two questions beyond it. And I think that's how business works now. That's what's saving me in my investor meetings now is you have to know your numbers. But at the end of the day, like, you just be nice. There's no reason to be a Just, that's not a, that's not a swear word. It's anatomy. <laughs> it's not a swear word. Just be nice and know your numbers and don't swear. Thank you.